Hear the words of the Collect for the sixth Sunday after Trinity. O God, who has prepared for those who love thee such good things as past man's understanding, pour into our hearts such love toward thee that we, loving thee above all things, may obtain thy promises which exceed all that we can desire. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. We pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. The collect for today places before us another opportunity to misunderstand the Christian faith, which comes from thinking that the promises of God are meant to give us a free ride through this life. Many people today believe in what I call a prosperity religion, which is that if they confess their faith in Jesus Christ and say that they love God, that he will then shower upon them the blessings of this world in abundance. Money, health, power, and all will be given to those who believe in Jesus Christ. That is the prosperity gospel. The problem is, is that if we believe this, then when bad things happen to us, the only thing that we can think of is that we've made God mad at us and that he is somehow withholding our material bounty from us who really deserve it. And when I hear ideas like this, I ask myself the question, do these people listening to this message realize that if that understanding of holy writ is correct, that God is no better than Zeus playing with the lives of his people as pawns, just like he did in Greek mythology. The idea of guaranteed material prosperity is directly opposed to what our Lord tells us is going to happen to us when we come to believe in him and to express that faith openly. Our, war, our Lord warns the disciples of this when he says in Matthew 26, 41, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Or perhaps one of my favorite passages of all scripture, which is from the Apocrypha, which is Ecclesiasticus chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. My son, if thou come to serve the Lord, prepare thy soul for temptation. Set thy heart aright and constantly endure, and make not haste in time of trouble. Cleave unto him and depart not away, that thou mayest be increased at thy last end. Whatsoever is brought upon thee, take cheerfully, and be patient when thou art changed to a low estate. For gold is tried in the fire, and acceptable men in the furnace of adversity. Or perhaps we would listen to St. Paul from the opening verse of the epistle for today, Romans 6.3. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Gee, sounds great, doesn't it? Temptation, adversity, death. Boy, sounds like an easy road through this life, doesn't it, when we come to believe in Jesus? Definitely not. And yet, at the same time, these are all the things that happen to everyone else in this world as well. They happen to non-believers just as well as to believers. These are the conditions that we live in and under every day. The difference is, those that believe in Jesus Christ and those that do not. They see these things in entirely different ways. Now, the key to understanding this difference is given actually in the collect for today, which I began with. When it says that such good things as pass man's understanding, the things which God offers to us are not of this world. And therefore, the world doesn't understand them because that's all the world and its people are concerned with, the world. So let's look at this understanding, shall we? Let's look at things that we can or think we understand. We know that we need money to survive in this world, and we understand, too, that temptation is something that we face every day. We know these two things very well. 
God tells us to do something, and then the evil one, or just we ourselves, go rushing ahead and do it anyway. Temptation. Adversity we understand. Yeah, things happen. They're bad. Okay, they happen. All right. These events are not fair. They're not easy. They're not simple, but they come anyway. We don't want them. Doesn't matter. They're going to happen. And when God tells us to die to ourself, we have a real problem. Because all we know is this life and we don't want to lose it. But do we understand what God means when he says this? I don't think we do. There are so many things that God tells us to do that we either don't understand or misunderstand, sometimes unwillingly, sometimes willingly. Yet here's the rub. If we could understand all the things of God and about God, then we would be God. Huh. Well, let me tell you, it's a good thing I ain't God because there would be an awful lot of lightning bolts going on throughout this world and a lot of ground opening up and swallowing things and stuff like that. And all I got to do is, I better tell you, you better not tick me off. But anyway, I'm glad I'm not God and you should be too. You see, I will gladly, gladly, gladly take the mysteries of God, the challenges of God, my understanding of God, as limited as it is, rather than me as God. I will take the mysteries of God long before I can take any God that I can put in a little box, even my little box. And especially, I love you all, but not your little box either. The main reason that I will accept these mysteries and these questions are twofold. I know that God does not lie. And second, that he loves me. These two things change everything. And that brings us to the gospel lesson for today. Our Lord tells the disciples in Matthew 5, chapter 20. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. The disciples were shocked. The scribes and the Pharisees were at the very peak of obedience to the law. They were considered the most righteous people in Israel. And here is our Lord telling them that if your righteousness does not exceed theirs, you're lost. You get nothing. Did they misunderstand? Of course they did. God looks not only at our words and our deeds. He reads our hearts. That is where the challenge is. Where does your heart lie? When our Lord looked at the scribes and Pharisees, he was not kind to them at all. He says in Matthew 23, 27 and other places as well, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead man's bones and of all uncleanness. It's not our outward body that determines our relationship with God. It is what our heart is telling us. And what, is, what our heart is telling him, that determines our relationship with God. As we were talking about before, when these young girls were kidnapped by El Shabaab. It was their faith and their hope that saved them, that let them endure, that saw them to the end and passed it. It can do the same for us. If we love God, it is the righteousness of the mind and heart. Those are the keys. Yes, the body will follow where the mind and heart leads. But we cannot just allow our lips and our actions to, quote, define our religiosity. So do not be deceived by soft words which lure our hearts and tempt our bodies. 
Do not be dismayed when we have questions or we face challenges or that we're trying to discern the mysteries of God that are indeed at the center of our faith. Instead, let us build our faith in Jesus Christ by following in obedience where He leads. Not because, he under, not because we understand, not because it's easy, but because that's where He leads. And that we will be able to, in the words of the bard, to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. And that we may live a life that pleases God in and through our faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.